I have a little bit of a history with this series. Uh, obviously, I'm familiar with Wasteland 1, but never actually played it. Or, to be slightly more accurate, I never played it for longer than five minutes. I just... I've said this before and I've said this again. I've never been into games with bad interface. That's not a recent thing. That was true back in the day, too. I'm probably more tolerant nowadays than I used to be. So, I never got into Wasteland 1. It's also the same problem I had with Fallout 1, if you've seen my stuff on that before. But then Wasteland 2 came out, and I was excited. See, I like the tactical nature of games like this, and obviously I like RPGs, and I like CRPGs, so it felt like a, you know, a match made in heaven. Sweet, I can't wait to play through this game. This is going to be awesome. And then I hated Wasteland 2, and we ended up putting it down after about a day of playing it. There's a lot of reasons why, but the biggest reason is because of what I nowadays refer to as factory worker syndrome, which is when you have to do a very difficult, irritating, frustrating task that will screw up completely if you don't pay attention and put all your effort into it over and over and over, and it gets very boring. So, when Layson 3 was announced, I was actually excited, because, you know, I wanted the game that I wanted from Wasteland 2, right? I'm like, ah, come on, come on, bring it to me. I mean, I know those kind of games can exist. I love the hell out of DOS too. So what do we got with Wasteland 3? Well, <sighs> let me use an example. I, want to ex I know this is a strange place to start, but the voice acting in this game is excellent. Like, legitimately some good nuance, pausing, cadence, tone, etc. Very good job from the voice actors. Big thumbs up. The voice direction in this game is awful in almost every scene. The way they're talking and how they're talking don't literally match either their characters or the situation in which they are speaking. There are precious few exceptions to this, but in general, the voice direction is literally wrong. And that is Wasteland 3 in a nutshell. Positive and negative at the same time. Do I think this is a net positive game? Yes, asterisk. But I do, and I do recommend you play it, asterisk. But the, for pretty much everything that's good about this game, there's something else that's also bad about it. I suppose that's true with most games. But let me just say that the final score on the gameplay axis, I'll show the stats at the end like I always do. But the gameplay was plus 48 to gameplay, minus 41 to gameplay. Now, some of you may or may not know that I have a little bit of a thing before I do the ruminations where I sit there and I try to... I, I run through what I want to say and how I want to say it and, you know, get a little bit of prep work in and kind of organize my thoughts, make sure I'm focusing on the things that I want to focus on, etc., etc. Especially for a game like this, which is, what, 52 hours, I think? Something like that. We've been playing this game for a week. So, you know... <sighs> um, but I kept... Like, I was going to tell you about just how much that this game uh, has issues and problems. I was going to tell you about how uh, how I got I was just bored to pieces of it by the end. I was going to talk about the combat. I was going to talk about uh, the reward structure and the itemization. But I kept running into a weird flaw because everything I was going to bring up always ran into this little wall, this asterisk, if you will. So let's explain the asterisk right now because I know there's a very, very common trend of people only watching a certain percentage of these videos, especially the more long-form, you know, talking head kind of stuff that I do. So, I'm going to put this as, fur as furthest forward into the video as I can so as many people can hear as this possible, okay? Very simple. Don't buy the DLC. It sucks. How much does it suck? Well, I have a little figure thing up here I could put up to try and track it. Uh, I gave 10 negatives to story for the DLCs and 9 negatives to gameplay for the DLCs. Oh, but how many positives? Zero. Hang on, it gets worse than that. The final golden number for this game was something like 40-something. We did a little bit of a calculation just to see. If the DLC was ejected from consideration, the final score is closer to 98. The DLCs are crap. And the thing is, they're not just crap in a vacuum, but they drag everything else down, down too. Now, really describing why would honestly take a while... So I'm going to try and truncate this. I've got a couple of bullet points I want to run you through, okay? Let's talk about itemization and rewards. So let's say that you're building a DLC, a quest, a section of a game, a chapter, maybe a level, a world, or a zone, and you want to inv invent this new mechanic that's just for this new area. It's this cool new thing. 
it'll be this fun thing that you can make and cool and awesome, right? Wonderful. But you need to introduce new mechanics to the players to allow them to accommodate for this. Now, let's say that you decide to introduce this concept called Holy Radiation, which gives you buffs and debuffs, which get worse the more stacks you have. Okay, that's kind of cool. But let's also say that you have slathered it so much everywhere that it's effectively impossible to avoid. So what you have done is kind of removed some of the agency from the player because you're basically forcing them to get radiated. Now, hang on, it gets worse than that. Because the item required in order to remove it, and I do mean required, I actually never successfully got all the radiation off my team by the end of the game. So the item that is, that is capable of getting this radiation off of you, depending on your choices, has a finite number of cures, essentially. So you can only get rid of so much radiation total ever for something that you can't really avoid that much. Now, this is part of what I'm talking about, but here's the catch. While you're going through, uh, you get a piece of armor. In, so you can go to one of three branches in any order. If you go to the third branch, or the second or the first, but it, we'll, we'll, we'll call it the third because it's the one I did last. If you go to the third branch, you find a suit of armor that gives you some resistance, aka the chance to not gain radiation stacks. That's the kind of thing that in a situation like this should probably be shoved much further forwards. It's not that great of armor. In fact, I didn't even wear it because it wasn't that great of armor. But it would have been nice to have that choice, and it's the kind of thing you could front load very easily. When you first walk in, there is a mandatory encounter, literally in the front door. That would have been a perfect time to effectively railroad the player into getting this armor and having that option to avoid at least some of the radiation. Hang on, it gets worse. Immediately before the final boss of this particular DLC, you gain a recipe to craft a new version of that armor, which sucks, but it has one unique thing about it. It has a great deal of resistance to holy radiation, a.k.a. the radiation stacks. Hang on, it's worse than that. When you fight the final boss of the DLC, the final boss drops a helmet, which is okay, but its main feature is total immunity to holy radiation. So you can just turn that off now. You have someone who's immune to it. Cool. Holy radiation does not exist outside of this DLC in any way, shape, or form. That's the kind of thing that you get towards the earlier parts not towards the end. Or maybe it should have been something that spread throughout the game, but you could see how a pattern of not design is developing here. Then we want to talk about the encounter design. Now, I could really dig into this, and I did on camera. Those of you who are there for it knows that there's this one thing, which is effectively three rooms, which is about four-ish total encounters, four groups of enemies, which you have to fight simultaneously while escorting both your, your characters and your truck further forwards, while fighting off all of these enemies which have way too much health and are constantly buffing themselves. Hang on, I'm not done yet. While the enemies are infinitely spawning every turn, while the enemies also have, occasionally, some of them have a thing where they just live. Basically, if you kill them, they stay with one HP for one additional round of action. Some of them have a thing where when they're hit, the entire game freezes. And they, I don't mean literally, but the game pauses and they do an animation and once the animation finishes, they gain a buff, and then the game can continue. Pause. This is an issue with the whole game. It reminds me of Battletech, uh, the, the tactical ver the one, uh, we actually did a stream of it some time ago, where the game couldn't move forward in action. Like, it's got a queue of actions, right? And it's like, move here. But nothing can happen until that animation finishes to total conclusion, and the animations are a little bit on the slow side. So... That's a constant problem that is very much a seconds and minutes problem in this game. Didn't start bothering me till the end, but I suppose that's how that works, isn't it? 52-hour game, etc. Moving on. So, you've got that slowing everything down. While there's a song playing, which is on loop, it's about a minute and a half loop, and this is an encounter that lasts probably about 40 minutes. Even worse if you're on higher difficulties, because higher difficulty, as a reminder, only changes two things. It makes it so that the enemies do more damage, and they have more health. So, everything about that encounter sucks. Literally everything. Which moves us on to the next thing I want to talk to. When you, This is more of the narrative side, but hear me out for a second. When you first enter this particular DLC, you are walked up to talk to the many, who are like, hey, join us, do these works for us. And you're like, no problem. And outside of literally just opening fire on the NPC, 
and you know, aggroing the whole town and failing the quest so the DLC is now done, you have no other alternative or choice. You are hard railroaded into working for the many. Now, if you're not getting the reference, I'm referencing System Shock 2. If you don't know what that is, the best thing I could say is that you're working for a group of people who have openly admitted to wanting to spread mutation across the wasteland so that all humans will eventually join them in their giant biomass. Spoilers, when you fight this creature as the final boss, it that exactly happens. Three, several of the NPCs who are with you all, you know, get bathed in radiation and melt and become part of the giant biomass, making the boss fight you have to fight. So, that's the thing you're railroad... And, and no questioning this, no debating this. You have to work for it, no, really, the end. The only choice you have in the... In, there's, excuse me, there's two. There's two choices you have in the entire DLC before you get to the end. One is whether or not you rescue a dude, who of course turns on you in the end, and the other is whether or not you decide to permanently kill one of your party members in order to avoid a single fight. That's it. But hang on. It gets worse. The biggest thing I want to impose upon you, impose, impress upon you, when it comes to these DLCs, is how unfinished and undesigned they are. There are some bad decisions, but for the most part, there's just a lack of decision-making. There's a lot of underthought, and there's a lot of just go with it. At one point in the second DLC, it's what I keep talking about here, and I'll explain why in a second, there are these two NPCs who you basically never encounter, who just mock you on the radio constantly. Now, in a good game, this would be part of developing them as a deliberate hate sink in order to, you know, make it so that you, you go after them and you, you shut them up and you get some kind of payoff, right? Not in this game. I know it is possible to find them and kick them out. However, several reports indicate that they just keep mocking you wherever they leave. So there is no payoff. There is no finishing that quest. There's just the mockery. And I do mean mockery because what they're doing is they're mocking the player. Every decision you've made up to this point, whether it worked out or not, they will try to slant in the most negative way possible and deride and belittle you for the choices you've made. When you finally leave this damn place, there's this one last middle finger to the player, where as you're leaving, they say, Bye, mass murderers, hope it was all worth it. They are so sanctimoniously judgmental in ways that are I can't even properly vocalize that I actually gave that moment its own separate negative because of how spiteful it was. I know that these DLCs were made during COVID. I really want to know, and I will never find out, if the developers were having such a hard time and were in such stress and duress and in just a really bad mental negative state that they just kind of took it out on their players because that is absolutely how it feels for both DLCs. Which brings me to the other one. So I said I wouldn't talk too much about Steel Town. The reason why is it's actually a lot harder to explain the problems with Steel Town because they're a lot more nuanced and a lot more systemic rather than just this encounter is bad or this itemization is bad, both things I could summarize relatively quickly. So just trust me when I say that there's a lot of really weird, large-scale problems with Steel Town. But there's one thing in particular I want to point you to. So minor spoilers for the game, okay? During the game, you get rep with certain people. Now, some of those reps come up and, and are relevant for story quests and purposes and which choices are allowed to you, as they should be in most good CRPGs, which this is one of those. One of those reputations is with the Marshals. Now, at Steel Town, there is a bumbling idiot who has done what we refer to as criminal negligence. Um, it's where you have been so horrifically negligent at your job and or incompetent at your job that you have caused severe damage and harm, including multiple deaths. So this woman, Markham is her name, she is extraordinarily bad at her job, Provably, I want to stress this isn't opinion. The game makes it very clear she is absolutely awful at her job and has no idea what she's doing. She has reached a point where she insists repeatedly on this same path, and while that could have been explained or it could have been massaged out, it's pretty clear the writers and developers didn't have the time or didn't spend the time on doing so. So instead, she's just an idiot that the game keeps insisting needs to be in charge. We didn't put her in charge. What we did was we kicked her the hell out, left her alive, got her comrade in, Blue, 
to help with Crow, one of the workers, and the two of them got the factory working together and everything was on the up and up. Worker rights improved, human rights were no longer being horrifically violated, and the factory was still producing the very mandatory, very necessary arms and armament necessary for the Colorado area to operate. Win, win, win. Doing that cost us rep with the marshals, which is the arm of the local warlord, who we are working for. I'll get to that in a minute. Fifteen rep. If that doesn't sound like a lot, please keep in mind that it, if I did everything right, and I mean everything, and when I say right, I mean if I just licked the marshal's boots, I would just barely be at the rep value I need for, a cer for certain endings, plural, in, with how huge of a detriment that negative 15 is. In fact, we proved on camera that the negative 15 was the specific thing preventing me from the ending I had been working for. Not that I knew it was there, by the way, I should probably mention that. No guide, no walkthrough, it's just I was trying to reach a certain outcome based on how the game was presented. And then at a certain point I realized it wasn't happening, I was confused, so then I looked a few things up and was like, ah, okay, so I need this and this. Why don't I have Marshall rep? Look, 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 look. Negative 15! And, and you know, then we started re reverse engineering a little bit and editing a few things to try and see how it works. And yeah, that negative 15 was the thing preventing me. If I toe the line and give people to them and help them out and do all kinds of things, like I, I came up with a list of, of I want to say like eight or nine things I would have to do to equal up to average out to that negative 15 I did. Now, if you're wondering why I'm hammering this point in so much, it's because it is exactly what I'm talking about. Underthought. It's there. No one really thought about how much of an impact that would have. No one really put any mentality into it. It's just there. It's just there, and screw you. Now, that's a lot of this game's DLCs in a nutshell. Screw you. By the way, the ending we did get uh, was really bad for two separate reasons. I could keep talking about aspects of the gameplay. I suppose I could. But I, I wanted to circle back to that Dragon Age 2 Syndrome thing I mentioned. About how I was bored with the gameplay. The truth is I wasn't. The combat is sufficiently interesting and engaging. The encounters are sufficiently varied. Um, there's a lot of terrain usage. There's lots of stuff you can do other than shooting your opponent. You know, little traps you can interact with or setting things or throwing items on the ground or using your consumables properly or flanking properly. And just there's all sorts of cool stuff you can do with the combat that, honestly, I wasn't actually bored with the combat by the end. What I was irritated by was the DLCs, which are also quite long, by the way. So imagine a nice chunk of game that's fun and interesting and engaging, and imagine in the middle of that you just kind of bloat it out with garbage. Don't play the DLCs. So the combat remained good, and I was into it. Um, there's even this cool thing where each enemy faction has their own gimmicks, their own shticks that they do that are different from every other one. So you always know what kind of things to watch for and what kind of things to do with regards to your positioning and your planning, depending on whom you're fighting. That's awesome. I also really enjoy a lot of the kit you have available. So you've got, I mentioned you know, you've got each of the different gun types, but each different gun type isn't just using a different source of ammo or having a slightly different rate of fire. How many shots they do per action, how much AP they cost to use, what range they have, um, the, t the type and variety of damage types they can support. There is a huge amount of variety of the guns. That's awesome. You've also got the perks you get for raising your skills. The skills you get every level, and then there's your attributes, which you get every level as well. Attributes are core stats. They improve everything in a category. Skills improve everything within a specific thing. Perks give you mutator bonuses, optional things that aren't just plus 5%, or oh, some of them are, but they actually can change how you play the game. One of my favorite ones that I got later on was this thing that makes it so that the sniper can stay in ambush mode after if he successfully kills someone with an ambush. If you don't understand what that means, let me put it this way. My sniper has 14 AP by the end of the game, okay? That's a very important number because his gun, his sniper, costs 7 to shoot. Two shots. Cool. What I will do instead is position him with the first 7-ish AP and then set up an ambush attack with the last 7, and he just sits there ready to go. Then an enemy moves. It's Overwatch from XCOM. So he shoots the person, kills them because he's a sniper with a gigantic gun of doom, and then kills the next person, and then kills the next person. Now, on average, he would kill four people with that. In other words, four shots instead of two. 
You're probably thinking, why four? Because his gun only had four shots in the magazine. It can only shoot four times before you had to reload. So he can only do that four times per round. But you see how that fundamentally changes how you play. Because all of a sudden, setting up proper ambushes is more important than setting up proper shots. Make sense? That's awesome. All of this stuff is awesome. The game's also pretty buggy. I kept running into this issue where the game would literally remove control from me. I could still click the ground, but nobody would move. And I couldn't pan the camera. And the game's still there. But every time it happened, I could never... I'm curious if anybody else ran into this. I've seen a few Reddit threads about this. I had to save and shut the game down and restart the game every time it happened. It was a fairly common bug. The game also has a huge memory leak problem because it's a Unity game, so that's how that works. Um... The game has a problem where occasionally it literally doesn't acknowledge your choices. Just straight up does not acknowledge that you've done something. I suppose that's inevitable in most CRPGs, but I've never seen it as bad as this before. On the plus side, I do love how the game has a full campaign co-op. I actually plan to play this game again with my friend someday. Minus the DLCs. Um, I also like there's this system in the game which is really cool. So... It's an AP-based system, just like Fallout. So you have XAP, actions cost XAP. But there's always, because of numbers, if, you, if your attack is 5 and your move is 3 and you've got you know, 9 AP, then you've got leftover, right? Well, there's this thing to do at the, to end your turn. You can ambush. I already talked about what that is. Uh, defend or prepare. This is great. Defend gives you a bonus to evasion based on how many AP you had at the end. And Prepare stores, I think, up to two of the AP for the next round. So you start off with two bonus AP for the next round. That is an awesome system, which gives you some modularity and some more control and choice over how exactly your people are going to move and attack and use. That's great. Love it. Um, almost every quest in the vanilla game has what I call the All Roads Leads to Rome quest design. You always get it up here. you got a lot of ways to go through that. This is true for encounters, too. There's a lot of levels... Areas, dungeons, whatever you want to call that, where you could go this way or this way or this way or set this or interact with this or blow this up or whatever. Now, I know a lot of this sounds like your typical CRPG stuff, but I just want to stress that as much as I spit venom and bile at the DLCs and the game makes a lot of mistakes, the truth is that the core gameplay and quest design and encounter design and general combat loop is awesome. I do recommend this game. I said I'd stop talking about it, and so I shall. Now, you probably expected me to drift into the narrative side of things, and I am, but I'm not really going to throw up a spoiler warning, because I don't really have any spoilers to share other than the fact that Lucy is the best character in the game. So, <laughs> the only character in the game. Keep Tom, keep Major Tom alive. You'll, you'll, you won't regret it. He literally had more health than my tank by about the midway point. I know, it's a technical, not a tank. Whatever. There are two major things I want to talk about in the narrative. And only two, really. Uh, three. I just thought of another thing. This game reminds me more of Fallout 3, uh, excuse me, Fallout 2 than Fallout 1. The tone is much more zany and wacky and quirky, and it's got a lot of references and it's got a lot of attempts at humor. Now, I only mention that because whether or not that, that's going to land or not, it's kind of up to you, right? I do think several things are decent, and indeed the game did actually make me laugh out loud once. So, I'm sorry, I don't mean that to sound as negative. It was a great joke. But that's kind of up to you on that one. But the biggest problem I had was the aforementioned character thing. This isn't a very character-centric game. And I think that's to its severe detriment. There are several characters in this game, some of which are memorable. But your party is made up of four randos who have no personality or faces or anything. And then two optionals you can carry with you. Now, I can compare this to a lot of other games to make my point here, but I'm going to point to your typical Bioware RPG, say, Dragon Age Origins. So, in Dragon Age Origins, your main character obviously is a blank slate, but you have a lot of ways to characterize yourself based on your dialogue. In this game, you generally have two, excuse me, three ways to characterize yourself. You can be as decent a person as you can, you can be a pragmatist who makes hard choices, or you can be an evil, raging psychopath who is legitimately horrifically evil. That's kind of it. Now that's okay. I'm not going to ding that. But what I am going to ding is the two party members you bring with you are barely there. They don't talk with each other. They rarely comment on the events that are going on. And they have no presence or relevance. This is a very non-character-centric story. Most of the characters poke their heads in, have their dialogue, and in most cases, unless they are a quest NPC, 
you'll never talk to them again because they'll never say anything new ever again. It is very much to the game's detriment, in my opinion, how much the game doesn't focus on character. Actually, actively focuses away from character. But the third and final thing I want to talk about... The game... has issues with its writing. The writers clearly want something. Uh, and this is something I've actually referred to, oh God, all the way back when I was doing the Voyager videos, this is something I talked about. It's because plot. You're here in the narrative. You want to be here. And so you make something happen because plot, even if it makes no sense, or even if you have to just hand wave it, because plot. Now, because plot can be done well, and has been done well, but it can also come across as rather lazy because you effectively put no thought or effort into it. You just said, this is the way things are. One of the, there's dozens of examples of that in this game, including the uh, time dilation field, which I'm not even going to get into, DLC. But the thing that bothered me the most the whole game is the game constantly and persistently insists that the only option for your people back in Arizona to survive is to side with the patriarch. This is never explained. This is never elaborated upon. This is never developed. There's no thought put into any alternatives or any other options or any other anything. This is the only way, if you don't do this, the end. And that's kind of what I mean. Because I feel like what the writers wanted was this, was you have to go in and follow the through on the theme of the work, which is hard choices. You know, you, you can't always be a saint when you're outside of paradise, right? And so I feel like the game really tried to push that element, but didn't know how to actually execute it. It's, it's the trolley dilemma. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, that's a good... No, no. The problem with the trolley dilemma, really, is the fact that it's very simplistic. You are given a very, very basic set of rules and told, A or B, pick. You're not allowed to think about it, or develop it, or to know the surroundings, or the circumstances, or the timing, or the hundreds, if not thousands of variables that should go into such a decision. Instead, this or this, pick one. Now, you could say that's relevant for something like this. You could say that that's the nature of video game design, and I would have a hard time arguing that. But my point is they lean on this so hard, and, this is related to my earlier comment, they have a tendency to really come down on the player for the choices you make. You need to make hard choices, and then they yell at you for it, or mock you for it, or deride you for it, or tell you how awful it is. And again, I'm not just talking about the DLC there. That's a constant element. I feel like that provided this nonstop, for lack of a better word to put it, negativity in the background of the entire game. And it's a damn shame, because the game is substantially better, better, better built, better built than a lot of other things Fallout I could think of when it comes to its world building and its consistency and how the politics work and the resources work and just a lot of other cool stuff. And Morningstar is awesome. So, now I'm going to give you the numbers. I've been trying to come up with a way to present this a little bit better, and I'm going to try to do that here. I don't know if I'm going to succeed, because I just don't have a lot of time in my life right now. Uh, thank you all for your feedback on what we've been doing so far. I'm going to try to make this a little bit more legible. But let's go ahead and... Again, I don't know these numbers. I haven't built the table yet. I'm probably going to try and figure out a way to do that before I record these things. But the first thing, of course, I want to talk about is the uh, pluses to story. Just the raw pluses to story. Uh, and that's not true at all. That's been showing on the game, on the screens forever, hasn't it? Uh, no, we'll put it here. Future me, go! Okay, so pluses to story. There's our story score. And you can kind of see how it lined up. Uh, and of course, then we've got our gameplay score. And I want to show you the table as well, obviously. Maybe I'll do it earlier than here. Now get rid of that, get rid of that. Let's show the table instead. So here's where we're sitting on uh, total pluses to story. I think, is that what? Is that what we're tracking? Oh, God. I'm so tired. I can't think of anything. I have no brain. Surely I have... Yep, there it is. Okay, looks like we are going to tell you the pluses. Okay, perfect. So here's where we're sitting. <laughs> On plus... You can tell I'm kind of trying to make this go without actually having the time to develop it properly. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Pluses to story. Uh, like I said, that's where that one lines up with all the other RPGs we've covered so far. And then here's our story density. Um... Once again, a bit of an explanation. The story density is 
how many pluses or minuses per hour that a game generates. Again, density is more important to me than length. Then we have the ratio. The ratio is how many points we gave are positive. So in other words, zero is terrible, 50 is neutral, and anything above 50 is good. Then we switch over to gameplay. Uh, this is the same general thing. We've got how the gameplay rates in a net compared to many other RPGs. RPGs tend to have rather weak gameplay. If you're looking at this list, you could probably see a little bit of that. Then the gameplay density. Same general problem. Uh, RPGs are long and tend to not have great gameplay, so the gameplay density tends to not be as great as something like, say, Mega Man. Then we got our gameplay ratio. Pretty much the exact same thing. Uh, you know, we've got how many of those points are positive or negative. In this case, I'm pretty sure this is close to around a 50 to 60-ish percent because, again, so many negatives and so many positives. Which leads us finally to, of course, the final number, the number that really matters, the golden number, which is, for those of you actually not aware, I actually got a couple questions about this, the golden number is the final rating of any game I review. Uh, it takes into account everything, it takes into account all these factors and actually several others, and it's a fairly long and involved sequence of formulas that punches out a number that gives a relative score to a game. And since we've been doing this for so long, we have a range, as you can see right here, of, you know, best to worst, at least within the RPG space. We've had a couple of games get up into the 200s, only a few, very, very few. And I think our worst game ever is like negative 40 or something like that. So you can see how this one spreads out. As always, I hope you've enjoyed. I'll see you next time.